Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today we are joined by Jerome Howard, Manufacturing Engineer, Technical Manager at Cronus Imaging. Webinar Wednesday, we would like to thank our sponsor, Cronus Imaging. Cronus Imaging offers alternatives to expensive OEM CT tubes and makes cost-effective third-party service solutions possible. Cronus tubes meet all OEM system requirements, including radiation dose output, and offer full CT system compatibility. Every tube they build benefits from decades of engineering experience and their legendary commitment to product quality. For more information, please visit cronusimaging.com. Just a quick reminder about our full MD Expo. We're headed to the Carib Royal Hotel in Orlando, Florida from October the 29th to the 31st. Join us for three days of education, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology products and services. Registration is now open, so for more details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Also, a copy of the pre-show planner can be found in the handout section of your webinar dashboard. Um, I'd also just like to add that in its continued effort to promote and applaud the men and women in the HTM industry, uh, Tech Nation magazine is introducing the Tech Choice Awards, also known as the Wrenches. Nominations are being accepted in a variety of categories, including Military BMET of the Year, Lifetime Achievement, and Humanitarian Award. Uh, the, nomina the nominations are being accepted through November the 3rd. Uh, up to 13 wrenches will be awarded, with the winners selected based on 100% on votes from those who make up the HTM industry. And the winners will be announced in the March 2024 issue of Tech Nation. Uh, more details, again, can be found in the handout section of your dashboard and online at onetechnation.com forward slash tech-choice-awards. Okay, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI, and you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE credit and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Uh, let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our Webinar Wednesday t-shirts to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Today is National Honey Month. Which state is known as the beehive state? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit your question anytime using the questions feature on your dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Jerome Howard and he will be discussing, is my CT tube arcing, how to diagnose and troubleshoot? Is my CT tube arcing? How to diagnose and troubleshoot. Hello all and thanks for joining us today. Here's a little bit about myself. My name is Jerome Howard and I've been in the industry for more than 25 years. Currently with Kronos, I wear many hats. I am technical manager, manufacturing engineer, return goods engineer. As a technical manager, I provide support to our customers. As a manufacturing engineer, I'm supporting our tube production. And as a return goods engineer, I'm supporting all the field returns for evaluations. Before coming to Kronos, I was with Philips for 14 years. And under the Philips umbrella, I served at All Parts Medical as a product support manager, as well as a logistic manager. And for Dunley, I was a technical support manager as well as a sales support engineer. Before that, did four years with GE in field service. And at the beginning of my career, I worked for Lixi Incorporated, uh, manufacturing industrial x-ray equipment. And there I was the electrical engineer. And my main focus was to design custom interfaces for x-ray control for our customers. The Kronos imaging story may seem just a little bit complicated. I'll try to explain it. We're located here in Aurora, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. 
Now, before 2018, the Aurora facility, which was Dunley at the time, was owned by Phillips Healthcare. Dunley produced replacement tubes for the, for the third party service groups and also produced a commercial line of OEM tubes for CT scanner manufacturers. Now, in 2017, Phillips decided to consolidate and move the production of the OEM tubes to the Philips tube facility in Hamburg, Germany. In early 2018, stay with me here, Kronos Imaging acquired the Aurora facility and entered into a contract manufacturing agreement with Philips. Now, under this agreement, Kronos Imaging will continue manufacturing the third-party replacement tubes, but would brand them as Dunlee for Philips. Seems a little complicated. Hang in there. The Dunley branded products were sold through Philips and their distributors. Now we fast forward a little bit in time and get to 2022. In 2022, Kronos released Kronos branded products for third party service. Now this is kind of where we are today. We have released our own line of products and these products are available to the public whether you come directly to us or go through your favorite supplier. All right, so we move on. In Q4 of 2023, just a note for anyone out there who has a Dunley tube, Phillips Dunley will exit the third party CT tube replacement business. Don't worry about it. We are here to pick up the slack. Just reach out to us with any questions regarding any Dunley warranties or any questions on our products. Here's our product portfolio. From left to right, we have the DA135 CTE, that's for a GE scanner. The DA165 NP is for GE as well. The S532 Acron, that's for the older Siemens scanners, the Siemens Summatome 16 the AU200 and the AU200C40 are also for GE scanners and those tubes are totally compatible with the uh, MX200 Ultra and the MX200, uh, what is that, the Performance 40, uh, which goes on the Optima 660 scanners. And we also have the AU240, which is our answer to the uh, Hercules tube or the VCT100. So before we get too far into this, I like to avoid confusion. So here's a breakdown of uh, the terminology used in this presentation. Tube spits is synonymous with arcs, HV plug or a candlestick, HV sockets, HV receptacles, HV wells. It just all depends on when you were trained, who trained you, so on and so forth. The terminology could be different between what you use and what your uh, <clears throat> your fellow field engineer uses. Um, dummy plugs and high voltage termination plugs are the same. Heat soak, tube conditioning, tube seasoning all mean the same thing. So hopefully this will avoid uh, some of the confusion that may be faced in the rest of this presentation. The high voltage chains are slightly different between scanner manufacturers. The different components making up the chain may be grouped into assemblies having different names, but the functions will be similar. Here's an overview of the high voltage chain on a GE scanner that uses our AU200 tube. The high voltage power inverter converts, converts DC voltages to AC that feeds the primary coils in the high voltage tank. The high voltage tank steps up the voltage to the kilovolt range. The high voltage tank is also where the filament current is placed on the cathode cable which connects to the tube. The hemet places stator current on the anode cable connecting to the tube for anode rotation. The tube itself produces the x-rays for diagnostic imaging. There are other modules that control the operation of the components listed but the voltages are not in the kilovolt range. The troubleshooting path for your scanner could be different, so be sure to check your service manual before proceeding. 
The path is also similar for monopolar and bipolar systems. The sequence shown below is simplified, so for your particular scanner, there may be additional steps that you may need to perform. So first, get a little background information on the issue. Uh, talk to the uh, technologists or maybe you know a couple of them in the department to get different points of views. Decipher the error logs. Remove the gantry covers and do a visual inspection. Utilize the available service tools and then run your diagnostics. Isolate and test your components in that high voltage chain. Repeat the testing of any components that failed for verification of the failure. You may want to do three or four different tests just to confirm that the failing component is actually failing. If your tube is suspect, then try additional steps such as seasoning or conditioning. Replace any of the bad parts, but do not return any of the parts or cores until your scanner is up. Anticipation of your scanner being up from a particular part being installed could lead to extended downtime. Confirm the replacement part fixed the issue. And depending on the results of your troubleshooting steps, you may have to dig a little deeper and repeat certain steps. Solving an arcing problem is easy, but identifying what the problematic component is, is definitely tricky. Avoid overcommitting to a completion time. I, I can't stress this more, but avoid overcommitting to a completion time. Our service folks understand that the site needs to be up as fast as possible. Unfortunately, the folks at the site don't think that we are aware of this. Arrange a time to report status updates with key members of the imaging department. Say you reach out to them every couple of hours and let them know how you're doing with your investigations and your troubleshooting. It is better to establish that time to report up and stick to that than to have them come looking for you asking when is it going to be up we have patience when is it going to be up so just kind of keep that in mind while you're troubleshooting arcing it is it can be a bit tricky and catch you off guard some of the background information you should be looking for is to find out what actually makes the scanner start arcing how long has the problem existed was there any particular techniques or protocols used that brought the problem on were patient scans interrupted you know were there errors displayed on the scanner uh, was the gantry itself tilted when this problem happened are any patient exams displaying image artifacts or are the techs noticing any arcing noises coming from the gantry? Check your error logs. If you have remote access, this would be perfect. You can take a look at the error logs and maybe make a determination on a part that you can possibly order and send to the site before your arrival. The error log will definitely give you a good place to start your investigation. If your particular scanner reports the type of arcing, such as anode to cathode arcs or anode arcs or cathode arcs, this will also help you to identify an area to focus in on. For example, if the scanner is reporting anode to cathode arcs, there's generally two places where that type of arcing can happen. That type of arcing can happen either in the tube itself, since both high voltage potentials are inside of that one component. Also, you would have both high voltage potentials inside of the high voltage tank. So inside of the tank itself, you can have an insulation breakdown and you're now starting to arc across the potentials as well as in the tube itself, you can have something going on the the vacuum can be contaminated and you can have arcing going directly from the anode to the cathode. 
Now it's time to remove the covers and look for evidence of oil leakage uh, anywhere around the high voltage cables where the cables are actually terminating into the high voltage sockets at the tanks or at the tubes. Any residual oil that's around that connection point uh, makes that connection suspect. And at that point, it would be wise to remove that high voltage plug from that socket and do a visual inspection to make sure that there's enough oil in the sockets and that there is no, uh, no evidence of arcing uh, within that socket. Check the condition of that high voltage plug as well. Take, take a close look at it to see if there are signs of arcing. Um, there could be cracks or swelling of that candlestick itself. Um, there also could be tiny little pinholes where arcing has literally arced through uh, that candlestick. Here we see pictures of damaged high voltage cables. The top picture was due to insufficient oil in the socket. The carbon tracking on the high voltage insulator there is actually etched into the candlestick. The socket that that was plugged into was able to be cleaned, but that cable was totally destroyed. The second picture shows a split in the candlestick you know, or a cracked candlestick, and that caused intermittent arcing. Uh, it took a while to uh, find that as well. Now, the third picture was a little bit of a bear. There's actually a pinhole in the insulation of the candlestick, and that caused intermittent arcing, and that went on for weeks until there was enough carbon buildup on the socket itself on the wall of the socket so that was that just created havoc it was hard to see it is very very small and it's circled there in yellow the fourth picture actually shows a cross section of a candlestick that had failed in the field we can see there circled in red um, the arc path that traveled through that insulation material before it exited the candlestick itself. Continuing with the visual inspection, check the condition of the sockets, any wafers or gaskets, and also the terminals at the end of the high voltage cables or inside of the high voltage sockets. If there's any signs of arcing, any carbon tra tracks or anything like that, see if it can be cleaned, if it can totally be cleaned away. If it can be cleaned away, then that's just a sign that there was either not enough oil in that socket or maybe the oil had broken down. It, maybe it's dirty or contaminated. The pictures here show, the two on the left show damage to the terminals. The top right picture just shows the application of the silicone wafer usually used on some semen scanners and the fourth picture bottom right shows arc tracking and cracking that has happened inside of that high voltage socket check the service manual for troubleshooting procedures for your scanner different tools and accessories may be specific for your scanner you are working on Start with no load testing. X-rays are not produced during this test. Don't isolate any components at this time unless instructed by your system manual. If this step passes, change the parameters of the test and make longer exposures. The goal is to get the system to arc. The next step would be to isolate the generator. Some systems require the use of dummy plugs. Dummy plugs used on GE scanners will allow for manual rotation or positioning of the components around the gantry. Example, you will be able to test a high voltage tank at 6 o'clock or at the 12 o'clock position without spilling any oil from the sockets. 
The pictures to the right show the dummy plugs that can be used on bipolar and monopolar GE scanners. And those are the three at the top. And then the two at the bottom are for semen scanners. Here are a few things to keep in mind while you're troubleshooting. Troubleshoot using a higher KV if your arcing is intermittent. This can help to make the issue more repeatable. When the arcing is more frequent, use a lower KV and increment it slowly until you get to the point where your instability actually starts. If your site uses 120 KV the majority of the time, and then arcing should happen when they select 140 KV, this may be a situation where you can condition or, or season the tube to stabilize it. Set your exposure times long during your testing. If the exposure duration is too short, your failing component may not have enough time to break down. Also, tilting the gantry could aid in identifying the presence of any air in your high voltage tanks that could be causing arcing. Let's isolate the power unit. With the cables removed from the power unit, fill the sockets with oil or use your dummy plugs if you have them. Pick a starting KV and run several iterations of the no load testing. Increase the KV as you go because again, we are trying to get the system to fail. Use long exposures greater than a minute. Depending on your system, you may be able to go up to you know, five minutes or six minutes or even 10 minutes and just see if breakdown is going to occur with the power unit isolated. When your maximum KV is reached during your testing, increase your exposure times and retest. The point of this is to definitely verify that your power unit is either stable at longer periods of time or if you can actually get it to fail and this of course shows you your failing component if this test should pass should pass definitely continue with your troubleshooting so backtracking just a bit your power unit let's say it does fail the no load test there are other modules inside of this power unit so depending on the availability of a replacement power unit and the correct revision numbers that are available, you may be forced with changing out some of the individual components that make up this power module or this power unit. So keep that in mind. That may be an alternative to not being able to get a power unit in quickly. You may just have to try and swap out some of the other components that are in this unit and hopefully one of those components could be causing your issue. So previously we had the uh, isolated power unit to pass and now we want to add another component to that which is the Hemet tank if you're working on a GE bipolar system. The high voltage tank is going to be directly connected to the Hemet tank, but the Hemet tank is not going to be connected to the tube and the cathode side of the high voltage tank is also not going to be connected. So those two sockets need to be filled with oil or dummy plugs. We're going to repeat the same test as we did before uh, with the uh, long durations and we're going to ramp up the KV through that no load testing. Again, the goal here is to get something to fail. If you can get something to fail, then you can pretty much assume that it's the last component that you've added or possibly that high voltage cable that's connecting the high voltage tank to that Hemet tank. If all passes, then move on to your next troubleshooting step. So in our previous test, we saw that the generator was fine. We couldn't get it to fail. And we also added in another component, which was the Hemet tank along with its high voltage cable. And we couldn't get that guy to fail. So next, it seems as if the problem is either with the high voltage cable going to the tube or the cathode cable coming from the generator to go to the tube, or maybe the problem could be the tube. But before we hang our hat on the problem actually being a tube, let's expand the testing 
um, by using some of the other service tools that are available on your system. In this case, for the GE system, you want to look at the shorted uh, inverter test as well as the gate command testing for your particular scanner. Still, don't rule out other components. You could have problems going on with your KV control boards, and also you could have still you know a problem with the hemi tank or an inverter or any of the other various components the tube should be the last component that's replaced because i do believe it's going to be the priciest and it's going to actually take the most time to install so don't be afraid to go back and retest everything and save the ordering of the tube or the replacing of the tube for last so all of the troubleshooting has pointed you to order a new tube and now you get that new tube and guess what that new tube is still arcing uh, you still have arcing on your scanner the chances of the arcing coming from that new tube is extremely slim i see this scenario way too often resist the urge to order a second replacement tube without calling us first a lot of times you may have to go back and do the diagnostic testing on the components that you've already tested because now you know for certain that the issue is not the new tube some field engineers actually order a second replacement tube just to install it and find out that it's still doing the same thing as the previous new tube as well as the original tube that was in the scanner unfortunately the diagnostics and the service tools don't really you know knock it out of the park and are 100 percent accurate in pointing at the device that's actually failing you may need to retest just to find out which component is actually failing but rest assured there is a device that is currently failing on your scanner and the chances of it being the tube has now been eliminated if other components were replaced along with the replacing of the x-ray tube and you're still having issues be aware of the revision numbers of those replacement components that were installed you need to check the revision numbers on those parts if there was a revision number difference between the part you removed and the part you installed follow up with your supplier and the OEM for that particular scanner and check and verify that that particular revision number for that part is compatible with your scanner in a lot of cases it may not be compatible and at that point you're just introducing additional hardship to your service call there is nothing worse than introducing a new problem to a set of problems that you already have this will do nothing but extend the downtime and really make the hospital administration extremely hot so wrapping things up diagnosing arcing in most cases is straightforward uh, no load testing is the tool of choice but that just depends on what type of arcing you're having arcing could have a current component uh, related to it meaning that the system is only arcing at some kv at some level of ma if this is the case then your no load testing may not be the best tool to use but it's definitely in your toolbox you may have to start investigating the kv and ma using kv and ma diagnostics on your particular system any other tools that you have available uh, in your arsenal you may have to pull out all the stops and use those two to figure out why the system is arcing at some particular MA level. Another thing to do is to keep track 
of all of your testing you know grab a notepad or something and just keep a log keep a log of what you're doing at the service call if you're doing test a you know write it down test a and then the results then you move on to step two what happened at step two step three step four if you end up being at the site for longer than you expect it there is a chance you're going to be tired you're going to get a little cranky and you're not going to have a clear memory on all the steps you've taken some people will but myself i would need to keep track of everything i'm doing so if you keep yourself a log it'll kind of prevent you from doing the same thing twice because you couldn't remember doing it the first time and also don't hesitate to reach out for support. I am sure that this problem that you are facing is not the first time this problem has come to surface. Somebody else has experienced it and may have a little bit of insight to help you focus on exactly what to look at or what part or set of parts should be replaced for that particular scenario. The chances of a new replacement tube arriving to your site displaying the same problems as your current tube that was in the machine is very, very slim. Very, very slim. So before you label that tube as a DOA, you may want to do some additional troubleshooting. If parts were ordered for your service event, don't return them until your scanner's up. Use long exposure times and multiple iterations of testing to check for arcing or to test for arcing. And sometimes components that are failing that you haven't been able to identify will become more evident when a new tube is installed. So here are some things that you should know. I'm not sure whether you really want to know them or not, but I'm going to share them with you anyway. Uh, if a tube or scanner is not being used for an extended period of time, you will definitely need to do some sort of heat soak or seasoning to that tube. If it sits idle for weeks and weeks, the tube could get a little gassy or get unstable. So it is best to start out with some sort of tube seasoning and you may have to do it a few times just to stabilize that tube. Older tubes running on your system, you know, if they've been in place for a number of years, may occasionally need to be seasoned as well just to make sure that they are electrically stable across all KVs that that particular scanner is able to to get to. Arcing usually creates streak artifacts, but I'm sure that most of you field service engineers know that. But for any of the newbies out there, um, this is a telltale that arcing is happening within your system just based on the artifacts. And another small little thing that people, a lot of people don't realize is if you don't reset the filament lookup table or reset the TNT uh, data for GE scanners, you are not uh, starting the filament currents out at their <coughs> default settings. There's a filament aging algorithm that happens with a lot of CT scanners and that current that's delivered to that filament slightly increases over time. So when it's time to put in a new tube, if you haven't reset that lookup table or that, that data, what happens is the filament starts out a lot hotter than it's supposed to be. And that leads to premature filament failure and the other uh, effect of that is the filament is burning a little too hot and the um, the tungsten 
is evaporating from the filament at a higher rate than is expected. That burnoff of that tungsten from that filament is now inside of your vacuum, which is inside of the insert, and now you create a path for arcing. So not resetting the filament database can lead to arcing. Everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks, Jerome. Um, we have got a couple of questions that come in. So if you're ready, um, here's the first one. So what is the advantage of using dummy plugs? Uh, good question. So dummy plugs for certain scanners will be required to do any high voltage troubleshooting, especially on some of the Siemens scanners. Now on the GE scanners, the dummy plugs will come in handy, especially if you are in a situation where you need to possibly rotate the gantry a little bit by hand. For instance, if the high voltage tank is sitting at three o'clock and you were to fill it with oil without having a dummy plug installed, right? So you're filling it with oil. You can only test that uh, that high voltage tank in that three o'clock position. But say you were using uh, the service tool, the dummy plug with it, now you can close that, that socket by using that dummy plug and rotate that high voltage tank from the three o'clock position, say to the six o'clock position. And you can continue doing your, your no load testing there. Maybe there's some sort of air bubble or something inside of the tank that the tank just needs to be in that in that that sweet spot for it to start failing on you for you to be able to identify that as a failing unit. Okay, great. Just a, another question here is uh, why use longer exposure time for KV no load dance death testing? Sorry, not a problem. So for KV no for KV no load testing, uh, a lot of times the the default parameters for the time that the high voltage is going to be on may be down in the seconds range, you know, ten seconds or five seconds or something like that. Uh, in a lot of cases with arcing, the presence of the KV or KV being turned on may need to be on for a longer period of time just for that failing component to actually start to break down. So that insulation in that component starts to break down and then arcing starts to happen. So using extended times is, is better for troubleshooting. Uh, if you use uh, the, the standard couple of seconds or something like that for a no load test, you can really uh, proceed in your path and go past the component that's actually failing because you didn't put enough time in the no load test. And, and another thing too, I wanna mention about the no load test as well is I've seen in some cases where field engineers would leave the high voltage plugs terminated at the supply end. And let's just say remove the other end of the high voltage cables from the tube in order to separate the system from the power unit per se to the tube. So now they're running a no load and your high voltage cables are not terminated. They're just flying or just, just hanging in free air. That's not a, a safe thing to do. Always consult your service manuals before you uh, do a no load procedure just to make sure you're following all the safety guidelines. So the, the point here is if that high voltage candlestick is just sitting out in air, depending on the humidity in the room, you can actually generate an arc in open air. And if your cable, if your high voltage candlestick doesn't have enough distance between 
whatever other component it may be close to, you can actually create an arc from that candlestick over to another component in your gantry. Or if someone is standing in a room too close, you can generate an arc to that person. But if you were gonna generate an arc from the cable to another component in the gantry, you're looking at something like maybe 75 kV that has now just jumped from that high voltage candlestick to a component in the gantry. And if that happens to be something with circuitry in it, rest assured that now you have just destroyed a component inside of the gantry. Uh, putting latex gloves or something like that on the end of a flying high voltage candlestick, yeah, that's not enough to isolate that candlestick. Um, black tape or a glove or something may work for isolation on low voltage, like just say 120 volt circuit, a, a, a live wire. If you were to put black tape on it, it'd be fine. You don't really have to worry about it because your voltage isn't getting that high. But when you're dealing with high voltage, a, a layer of black tape or a glove is not going to prevent that high voltage arc from coming through that insulation and possibly damaging another component on your scatter. Perfect. I've got another question coming. It's, um, I've never worked with tubes. What is seasoning? Seasoning is a, is a process that's used to stabilize the, the electrical stability of an insert inside of an x-ray tube. So the atmosphere inside of the insert is a vacuum. So that vacuum could have a stray particles or a little bit of gas or something inside of that vacuum. And what happens is when you introduce high voltage, now you have small arcing that starts to take place inside of that insert. So in order to clean up the atmosphere inside of that insert, you want to perform the tube seasoning. And what the tube seasoning is going to do is it is going to introduce KV to that tube and it is going to slowly increase over time. So say a seasoning process may last 15 minutes or may take 15 minutes to perform. So what's happening is that insert or the tube is being exercised from say 70 kV or 80 kV and it is slowly increasing up to its maximum. And if there is some small arc that happens within that increase, then one should reduce the KV and start the testing again, or start the procedure again, just to get through any of those small arcing events to create more stability in the tube. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question here is, can heat socking or seasoning sometimes kill the tube? It just depends on the age of the tube, but let, let me put it this way. If heat seasoning or heat soak is going to kill the tube, the tube was going to die relatively soon anyway. So the heat soaking and seasoning procedure, that's one of the tools that's, that's available to you on the scanner to help to condition that tube and keep that tube stable. If that, to, if that procedure is going to kill the tube, know this, that you are now in control, you have killed the tube instead of the tube dying in the middle of a patient scan. Okay, uh, another question here about tubes is, how can we isolate the arcing in tubes? Well, if the tube itself is actually arcing, Unfortunately, the tube is at the end of the high voltage chain. So when you're running no load testing or KV and MA testing with everything connected and, and the arc is actually happening in your tube, there's no way to really isolate that. 
unfortunately, all the other components have to be in play before you can get um, high voltage to the tube. Okay, now before we wrap up, Jerome, is there anything you'd like to expand on or summarize? I uh, just want to go back and look at the uh, or mention the product po portfolio that we have. Uh, we have six products and five of those are for replacement uh, tubes for CT scanners and one is for the Siemens, uh, Siemens scanner. Again, that is the DA-135, the DA-165NP, the AU-200, the AU-200C40, as well as the AU-240. So the AU-200 is a direct replacement for the ultra tubes or the MX200s. The AU200C40 is a replacement tube for the Performix 40 tubes for uh, Optima 660 scanners. The AU240 is a replacement for the Hercules tube, or I think it's called the VCT Pro 100 that goes on the VCT scanners. Uh, your DA165 and the 135 uh, our replacements for some of the scanners that, that use a lower power. That's great. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jerome, for your time today and for a great and informative presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to the industry. So please visit cronusimaging.com. As promised, the answer to, tri to today's trivia question is Utah. So congratulations to our winner, Serena Dornick. Enjoy your T-shirts. And a quick reminder, you can obtain your C certificate by completing the post webinar our survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar, so please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you once again for your time today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.